You're listening to the Friends Talking Nerdy Podcast Network. Friends Talking Nerdy! If your friends are nerdy and you are nerdy too, I want to talk to you. Friends Talking Nerdy! Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy, the 251st time I've ever said that. This is Tim Jowsma, and joining me all the way in Portland, Maine, coming on back after a couple of weeks of uh, activity, we have the Reverend Tracy. How you doing? I'm doing pretty great, Tim. Um, yeah, like I've kind of been really busy lately. Um, you know, I... Uh, it, it's just been interesting times, right? Because mm-hmm. everybody's aware I am a step parent. I moved across the country. And so things that even my friends ask me, when are your stepkids coming out? So, uh, you know, Tim's been a really awesome friend, like just kind of to shout out wave of appreciation for a good friend that I was able to reach out to deflect with some humor and just kind of rage invent sometimes as frustrating as these situations can be. But um, that finally wrapped and came to an end. So that big stressor is now over. Um, so super, super awesome time. So thank you guys for anybody who is just, oh, it's not the same without the Reverend. I am so sorry. I am back. I try not to, to be absent like that. But in other exciting news, I started a new second job this week. Um, I'm a big gig person. I think I've mentioned that like I pick up gigs and uh, it's just this one's a a gig in our favorite bagel shop which I think is really cool like how it happened by the way because I think I just basically did the job equivalent of a you know I I think I've mentioned Gravity Falls on the show before my Mm -hmm. brother got me into that show by saying that he believes that I am grown up Mabel and there is a line that Grunkle says about Mabel um uh, that said, uh, you know, Mabel made uh, pen pals with the pizza delivery guy at the five seconds he was at the door. And I basically did that, but with a part time job. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been going to this place. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot I love about Maine, really. Uh, and a lot of it is like kind of the attitude. Like I am a regular at places where people really actually know my name again. And I haven't experienced that since small town Texas land. So mm-hmm. it's it's refreshing to be in a place that's not small town Texas land, but still has like that kind of good element. And, uh, you know, there's a worker shortage and you kind of see it in the favorite places and the people that you get to know and get to like at these places and get on a first name basis with. And um, so it, it came to my attention is like, oh, wow. I mean, I know I've known for a while, right? Like everybody's got their help wanted signs up and it's, you know, been mentioned. But there is one day where they just had to shut down like their entire sandwich making because somebody was sick. And she's she had just kind of said, like, no, really, I have like, I think, four or five people total that work here. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, you know, it gets really real when you become friends with people. And because, (laughs) as we all know, our family court system doesn't go and make things cheap. So I could actually use some extra money in my household. They could use a set of competent hands who can be friendly with people and give them delicious bagels. So we came together and I literally got the job application yesterday morning when the Mr. Reverend and I went to go trade ourselves to bagels because we are regulars here. And I filled it out while having some breakfast with him and dropped it off on the way into my other job. And then I had my first day today, which was total trial by fire. It was <laughs> insane and busy, but you know, it, it's, uh, it seems like it's going to be a good fit. It's very familial. We got to kind of talk and chat and get to know each other. So I'm overall, I'm pretty excited. Like, am I super stoked to be in a position to need a second job? Eh, Not super, but if the situation is going to be that you're getting to kind of just spend more time with people that you seemed to get along with in passing, like, I think that's my new favorite way to get a job. So uh, yeah, I'll be doing that for at least a little bit. And hopefully they can hire some more like people who can be there more because my schedule is restricted. But yeah, uh, hopefully the worker shortage starts to turn around and good businesses like this can get good people. 
Yeah, I don't like the term worker shortage because I think a lot of this is uh, in, in the general um, in the generalized scheme of things. I think what this is is workers are finally um, up, finally standing up for themselves. And I, and 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 the biggest offenders here when it comes to employers are your big companies, not your mom and pops. Unfortunately, they're the ones that that are going to be doing some real suffering in this. As, as kind of an offshoot for the crimes of like an Amazon, a Walmart, places like that. Right. When I say the term worker shortage, it's mm-hmm. more like supply shortage. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Like they, they do not have the workers at these places. So just to preface that, just in case that means yeah. anything else out <laughs> there, um, when I say worker shortage, that's my meaning. I, I'm, no, I'm unaware if this is some hot term that like has a meaning that I'm unaware of. It may. I, I don't well, know if it's a talking point word. It's just to me, it makes sense. You have a shortage of workers and that's going to affect things like your store hours, like being able to serve certain things or have certain items or certain, you know, services. So I, I guess that's more of like my meaning of it when I say it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me though, I'm the cynical guy who, uh, you know, toiled under the, the, <laughs> the, the a, a big corporation for a long time myself. So it's, it's kind of like what we talked about with TNT. Like what I'm seeing right now is that when it comes to like the phrases like work or shortage, it's, it's kind of like the last episode of um, the season one of F is for family. When the guy who owned the airline, you know, said on the news that these poor workers are preventing you from going home to your place. And, that's a lot of time what we're seeing, you know, like the CEOs and like CEOs of like, like McDonald's or something like that coming out complaining about worker shortage yet they're collecting all the money while the workers are getting treated like garbage. You know, that's not cool. Right. And it's not the mom and pop shops that are doing exactly. That. Exactly. exactly. That's, so yeah. like they, yeah. So it kind of makes this interesting competitive thing. It goes back to, I mean, I think I've shared on here before, maybe we don't need Starbucks right across the street from each other and McDonald's yeah. right across the street from each other. Like maybe one's good. And if it's busy, they can go to other places. <laughs> yeah, you don't need seven McDonald's in a two block radius or seven right. Starbucks, you know, like that is the weird thing about the West Coast compared to Grand Rapids. There are more Starbucks compared to churches. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was actually talking about like, I think I've only seen three Starbucks and one. There's only two that I think that are actually drive throughs <laughs> So mm. one's like plugged into a store somewhere, I think. But yeah, it, it's still interesting to be like, it's such a lack of coffee places over on this side of the world but uh, how's your week going oh really really good we did hear some uh wonderful news for um the podcast network we actually have a new show that has joined us um a gentleman by the name of george Saroy has a podcast called excelsior journeys which has joined the friends talking nerdy podcast network i was i'm really excited about that me too. I had nothing to do with this. Um, yes. Yay. I, I mean, you you did let me know, of course, but. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, so definitely excited to, um, you know, get, you know, get to know him some more. Um, you know, I already let him know that, you know, we are at his disposal. If he needed, you know, help from us in terms of like guesting on his show, we would do that. He can certainly guest on our show. You know, like the whole point of the network in the first place when we started it up was just as a way to support each other. You know, like we have no illusions that our podcast network is similar to something like NPR or, or something like that. All we are is just, you know, people who love podcasts podcasting and now we got someone else that loves podcasting that hopefully together we can work together to you know build our audiences collectively because i think there is something in numbers together and for me especially in an artistic uh, situation when you're doing something creative why go the negative route why don't you work towards building other people up that is the best thing that's that's what you're supposed to do And, and i'm glad we can do this with the show same. And I'm, I'm excited to, uh, I mean, I don't get as much time to listen to podcasts as I used to. <laughs> I don't listen to ours and Tim already knows that, but that's okay because I was here. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully like I can find a little bit of slice of time to listen. I've actually been taking a little bit of a break from my news for a little bit. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. honestly think that's still a nice thing to do from time to time, especially because really a lot of the high ends are updates on Ukraine. I just kind of decided to take a little bit of a minute off, but you know, also just still getting back into the rhythm of normal life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that too, I am still uh, on the final days of uh, surgery uh, recovery from my vasectomy. And that was an interesting experience. 
<laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah, like the day of the surgery, um, you know, they have they have you take like a, a Valium and a Percocet, and I thought, you know, ooh, I'm going to be real stoned, but you know, with the amount of uh, marijuana I've had over the years, it was barely nothing, you know. So <laughs> I get to the I get to the office, and um, they immediately bring me to the back room. They prepare. They say, okay, you know, take your shorts off, get up on the table and whatnot, and you know, put this little uh, like thing over you. I put the thing over me and then my doctor comes in and my doctor, he looks like Nikolai Volkov, former WWF tag team champion. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm in good hands. <laughs> you know? And he goes there and they're like the little covering over my junk, you know, and he pulls it off, but he pulls it off. Like he's like a magician or something, pulling a tablecloth off a table, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then he explains what he's going to do. And I'm like, whatever, I'm not looking at him, not, you know, have my eyes focused um, because I learned this in therapy actually it's kind of a distraction my eyes focused on a bit of the ceiling just looking and then you know he said he was gonna you know, like clean up the area first and then like if i didn't look but he was essentially using a baby wipe down there to clean up and i'm thinking well you know some guys pay good money for that i'll just let him do his thing and, <laughs> and, um, and then yeah once uh the surgery got going just uh just slice and dice it was over in less than 20 minutes as far as pain I didn't really experience any. If there is any guy out there that is hearing this, that has had doubts, that that are scared about this, the Reverend can confirm that I am a baby when it comes to pain. The fact that I went through this procedure with, with, with a smile on my face at the end of the day, I mean, just please, if you are considering it, it is the smart, respectful thing to do. Please do it. Yeah, um, you. I, I didn't hear from you too much. I just kind of like left you alone for a day or two. But and I knew mm. you're like, you know, when you were waiting to go, I heard from you more. It goes back to you know we're friends in real life, <laughs> so of course we talk outside of here. And so it was kind of nice, like in a, in a fun way, we got to support each other a lot over these last two weeks. Indeed. But um, yeah, and then you know. I, I, th I think I did a good job at helping you stay calm. I, I didn't, didn't, didn't feed into the, Oh yeah, you should be freaking the fuck out. Like, <laughs> Oh yeah. You, you definitely, you definitely helped. And um, I, I, I love, I loved the recording that I ended up doing for um, hump day after the surgery in the car. Mm -hmm. Like um, I was conscious. I remember uh, doing that, but like part of me, it, part of me just was, just not giving two shits during that recording because like halfway through um the part when i'm in the car heading back home there's like a part where like a, a driver got in front of us that annoyed me and then i started cursing him out in the recording <laughs> and then immediately went back to talking to what i was talking about like the guy wasn't there but you know <laughs> <laughs> but good do you feel good just having it done though like it's it's over yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I talked about it in the episode, like, you know, if you're 45 and if you're 45, I mean, ki kids, raising kids is for the young. It really is. If you, if you have the resources to do it and you're older and you want to do it by all means, go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. But at the end of the day, raising kids is for the young at 45, you know, I shouldn't be worrying about that. And with my credit report being what it is, I really shouldn't do that. If I ever, you know, have any hopes of digging myself out of my current hole of thanks to kids I have, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's that age is also going to slide for different people because I know mm -hmm. like there is a really good Adam ruins everything about pregnancy and ages and that whole like things doubling at 40 and like what that actually even means, which is, it's by the way, it's doubling from like a point oh 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 something percent, I think, if not a point oh oh percent something. Mm -hmm. I, I forget how many zeros were before the actual number. So just to put some things into perspective, there is some myth on that, but it does depend on you. Like you also just know when you personally, I'm like, no, I wouldn't want to have kids at this point in my life. Yeah. Because there's some that do have them into their 40s and do totally fine. You know, like maybe the super athletic people that you know do because yeah it just it depends on how much energy you feel you have and if you know you're done and like oh yeah no i would definitely not want to raise children at this point like why not take those steps to go ahead and do something like that so i'm incredibly proud of you there's not a lot of people that would actually do that so i mean there are plenty which is more of like yeah i'm, I'm glad you're you signed up for it got it done um because yeah even if you are afraid of surgery there's kind of that logic you can hang on to 
I, mm-hmm. I love my logic rocks, a little <laughs> bit of a teaser for our upcoming TNT season. Um, that logic that you can like kind of grapple on to is that there are so many people who get the surgery done and there's like probably little to no complication. If there is, I haven't heard of any high like complication statistics with it. So, I mean, yeah, if you're considering it, by all means, look into it, especially if you can't afford to do it, if that's in the situation that you have. Um, but yeah, there's no shame in it either way. There's no shame in deciding that you don't want to have kids and you'd like to do the thing in your control to make sure that doesn't happen. And especially to guys for the ladies in your life. I mean, this, the procedure itself is going to be cheaper than a woman getting her tubes tied. And it's it's going to have a lot less pain involved compared to a woman getting her tubes tied. So it's yes. it's, 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 it's a respectful thing, too. It's just like, yeah. why wouldn't you do that? And also, um, I know a lot of tubal ligations, which is what that's called. Um, mm-hmm. They try to do them like with a, a pregnancy birth or something. I think there's something about that situation that actually makes it easier, but yes, it is, I believe more risky because it is, it's more of an internal surgery, right? Like at best it's going to be laparoscopic with stuff going in. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, uh, the, the male version of vasectomy, it's, it's almost like an external surgery. Oh, it is. Yeah. Because there's nothing that has, there's no scopes. There's no anything that's got to go in. I even think they have like a thing where it like pulls, doesn't it like hook and pull something out and then they like do. I wasn't looking. But anywho, (laughs) but I was curious about these things before. So I did look it up. It's been a really long time and I don't know if there's been like updates. You know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. like, it it blew my mind when they spayed my cat laparoscopically because I had no clue that that had extended to like cats. So if they're doing that for cats now, I have no idea what they're doing for women, but, um, (laughs) but I do know that involves like going internal for women, which that in and of itself will automatically make a surgery more complicated. So if you're a dude and if you've got those respective dude anatomy parts and you've decided that you don't want to have a kid, oh, by all means, please take that under your own control. And if you get somebody pregnant, maybe don't blame them. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And, and, And for perspective here, um, the tattoo that, you know, we got together that hurt Mm -hmm. more than the procedure. Keep that in mind. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and granted that's an easy spot to get a tattoo. I just want to point out. Um, so where Tim's talking about is on like kind of the fatty part of your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is one of the easier places to get one. So the fact that that was more painful because I've got kind of a lot in a lot of places, I can kind of confirm that was my least painful ones were the ones on my shoulder in that spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that seems like it was probably pretty simple. It almost sounds like getting my IUD probably hurt more than your, uh, your vasectomy, which is interesting now that I think about it. Yeah. I mean, they, um, really the only honest thing that hurt during the procedure was the medicine that they used to numb the area because um, when they initially put that in, it really feels like a kick in the nuts, but within like five seconds, it's gone and you don't feel anything. Um, so, but so yeah, that would, that was that. And, you know, so that is is complete and I am for the most part healed apart from a few tender spots. So yay start the show this week we wanted to lighten things up this week and talk about abortion (laughs) so somewhat related speaking Mm -hmm. of like the general conversation of of uh what to do like basically contraceptive type stuff i mean granted not a lot of people really like to consider abortion a type of contraceptive, but it is technically something that you can do if you do not want to have a child. So kind of related to what Tim was going through this week. Yeah. And and the whole idea behind this, too, I mean, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll say from the start, we're not proclaiming we are absolute experts in this. We only bring this information up as a way for you, the audience, to take the ball and dig a little further. But um, I know growing up in, uh, you know, like as a kid in the Christian circles, that I did, there was a lot of miscommunication about abortion. And I think, you know, once I started, you know, getting actually clued in about, you know, stuff like that, I I felt stupid, you know, when I was older at how easily manipulated I was by that community, you know, and it's, and having said this, I want to make it clear. I'm not, um, this episode is not going to be dedicated to bad mouthing Christians out there. We're not going to do that. This whole, this whole thing, again, it's just kind of a abortion 101 talking about some basic facts here. And um, the Reverend has done some wonderful research uh, this week. Yes. I'm a pretty big fan of the Britannica. So the encyclopedia people, uh, they do 
pages. And we kind of used this page once before, too, if you recall our should we legalize marijuana conversation, but kind of going a little bit differently this way. But I I think it's cool to go through there and read what are considered the top pros and cons as far as should abortion be legal or not. Um, And I wanted to go through that just kind of quickly, because really, um, I mean, I kind of know how I feel about this one. I'm pretty sure I'm going to come out on abortion should be legal. Mm -hmm. But I like having kind of these difficult conversations that are out there that, you know, maybe people don't necessarily get a chance to talk about because it kind of gives a, a chance to expose myself to like different perspectives. Right. Because I did read both lists, like both sides had their pros and cons to it. So that's what I figured we could base this off on. Did you have anything else you wanted to add before I start bringing those topics up? Uh, Well, no, I just wanted to concur that, you know, this is a good idea. Like the, again, this is done to dispel these myths here. So what is number one on the list? So, and I'm not necessarily doing these in the order of the list like I did last time. I just kind of went through and, and let it kind of guide me to like, all right, what are the kids saying these days about the old A? So (laughs) one of the big pro con, and I'm really just kind of comparing them because, you know, a lot of the time the pro side has kind of a a con that's counter to it. So I thought it'd kind of be easier to talk about it that way. But one of the biggest arguments, which I'm sure we are all super crazy familiar with is the big question. When does life begin slash what does big G have to say about things? Because that is kind of the, the big deal, whether you're religious or not, right? Because it's whether or not does life begin and does this human have a right because you know what? we like to talk about when humans get rights, correct? So mm-hmm. does do you get rights when life begins? And if so, when does that technically happen? Or does God says we shouldn't do it, right? Um, is it at conception or is it once they are viable slash able to live on their own? So it just answers the question, is it murder or not, right? And a lot of people kind of go back and forth on this because that's one of the big ones is, are you murdering somebody technically? Uh, An interesting little today I learned tidbit when I was reading all about this is there's studies from the Pew Research Center that show that Jews actually overwhelmingly support abortion rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned that apoplectic means really angry. So going into that part of it, uh, there was a Chicago-based rabbi named Dana Rutenberg that talked very openly about this when I was looking into it. And she said, it makes me apoplectic. Uh, (laughs) um, And basically, she's talking about the interpretation of abortion. Um, She goes on to say, most of the proof texts that they're bringing in for this are ridiculous. They're using my sacred sacred text to justify taking away my rights in a way that is just so calculated and craven. And Rabbi Rutenberg takes issue, basically, she's talking about how conservative Christians are pointing to Psalms as proof that abortion should be illegal. Um, Yeah, so I thought it was really kind of interesting to read, because when you think of like the more conservative of like the the branches of Christianity and, and God and all those sects, I would say most people would think that Judaism, the Old Testament, it was a bit more strict than than the new. So this was honestly something I learned was that I didn't know that there already was kind of this discussion in at least Judaism that had decided that that's not when life should begin. Um, so across the country as a wave of anti-abortion legislation reinvigorates the fight over reproductive rights. There are Jewish leaders, activists, and women that are speaking out in favor of a woman's right to choose. Like th- They shouldn't be using these texts to justify it. Um, it's not just that the U.S. shouldn't be deriving law from poetic language, which is something else Rutenberg was expressing. It's that the Jewish tradition has a distinctly different reading of the same texts. While conservative Christians use the Bible to argue that a fetus represents a human life, which makes abortion murder, Jews don't believe that fetuses have souls, and therefore terminating a pregnancy is no crime. So uh, I thought that was a really interesting interesting thing to learn when I was researching the when does life begin and is this murder question. 
Yeah, it if it really has only been since at least the late seventies, early eighties that um, the whole idea of abortion um, being solely on on the Christian conservative side of things really happened. And, you know, we can thank uh, Jerry Falwell for that, um, because in the past, uh, religious wise, it was really only the Catholics, if I'm not mistaken, that that, you know, were truly, you know, you must not have abortion under any sort of circumstances before that. But Jerry Falwell in, in his way and he was successful at it doesn't mean I have to like it, but in his way to use the evangelical Christian vote as its own own little political force, he had to have something to kind of get them all together. And, and what, what's the easiest way to get people together? The children, you know? So, so if you do look back on the history of how abortion became such a prominent issue in this country, you're going to see religious people along the way that are taking Bible verses that they know are, don't talk about, that don't relay anything to their message. They're going to use that because that's what they do. They're hucksters, you know, for those type of people, Jerry Falwell type of people, not all of them. <laughs> there we go. We, we do try to take the mentality. It, it is the way of the Sith to speak in absolutes. So Indeed. I'm not trying to say anybody is bad. However, I don't know. It's kind of interesting to read this interpretation because I, when I think of Christian conservatives, I think of how, you know, we do have a political party who is very much in the Christian conservative realm. They're very open about it. And it's kind of one of the reasons that I don't honestly believe we have separation of religion and state because I don't even need to say what party I'm talking about for most people to put together what party I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So, and the fact that, you know, those are the people who make decisions over things like this being legal or not, um, you know, furthers that a little bit. But anyway, <clears throat> that was really kind of all I had to say about when life begins or not. I, I think I would personally be more that it would begin when it can live on its own. Yeah. And right. I, like, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, it, yeah, if, if the baby does have a chance to survive on its own without being attached to the mother, then yeah. And also, com un unlike the arguments people gave in the 90s when partial birth abortion was a thing, women don't carry pregnancies to the eighth month and then decide, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. That That doesn't happen. Yeah, that super doesn't happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not normally the, when the decisions are being made. I, I think most of people, like, and I didn't look any of this up, but I'm sure you could find statistics out there of, you know, most people have already made that decision possibly even before they were pregnant, mm -hmm. um, that they knew that if that happened, that is something that they would be willing to do because they feel strongly about that. Um, you know, there are places where it is actually hard for a female bodied person to get lifetime, you know, like a, a tubal ligation, because there are doctors who don't feel comfortable doing it until you are, excuse me, in your forties. I, I got that conversation at one point when I was trying to think of if I wanted to do that permanently or not um, at one point in life. And that's basically what I got told was I probably would have a hard time finding a doctor willing to, because I was so young. So there's something to consider there too, is there's not really, you know, that factor. Not that that's necessarily anything to do is what the big G have to say about it. But, you know, if that, that is like your option, if you know, you don't want to have a kid, um, anything else on, on whether or not life begins what you think on that one, uh, on, on anything on that topic, I guess. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think I've said where I stand on that. Yeah. I mean, if the kid is to a point to where it could survive on its own without the mother, then, you know, then I think by that time, let's talk about, you know, like adoption, you know, it, it, and that's generally what would happen anyway. But yeah, like uh, the the kid first fertilizing the egg, I mean, the sperm first fertilizing the egg, you know, that is not a human life. It's not. It's not. Right. Because like part of what I find interesting that I feel like it's not really considered a human life yet is it's not like there's a homicide investigation at every miscarriage. Um, you know what I mean? So I guess that's where that never made sense to me personally. It's like, but wait a second, if this is a human life, like where's its rights? Like, you know what I mean? Like most people, if you're found dead, they're going to at least try to figure out why you were dead to yeah. make sure you weren't 
murdered or, or anything like that. So, I mean, yeah, to my knowledge, I don't think they question it if you just say, oh, I miscarried. Like, Generally not, but, you know, there are... I mean, you know, there are stories of places in 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 places that don't support abortion to where you would have it. Like there's a, a, a woman in Texas that briefly a couple weeks back had, uh, had had been charged with murder because she ultimately in Texas said that she helped facilitate her own abortion. Um, luckily the DA in that particular case said that there wasn't, uh, anything that they could really do. So they didn't go forward with that. So good news for that woman at that particular point, but, you know, uh, you know, kind of tying into what something you said earlier, you know, it's must be horrible for people trying to get protective healthcare like this in a, in a setting to where you can't really trust people because apparently this woman that had to deal with um, getting arrested and possibly charged with a murder case for doing the abortion herself, her nurse ratted her out when, you know, like your nurse is like legally not supposed to do that. Yeah. And what's funny is I'm from Texas. So that conversation where I was told years ago, by the way, Mm -hmm. um, good luck finding one. That was in Texas. So nice little piece of, of context there for the folks yeah. listening at home. <laughs> Go to my sultry radio voice for no fucking reason. Um, so I guess the next point that I found interesting mm-hmm. was, does the fetus feel pain? This one I wanted to talk about because there is direct contradictions on whether they can or not. And I thought it was interesting, the arguments for whether or not they can. So Bernard N. Nathanson, he is a doctor. He's a late abortion doctor who renounced his work and became a pro-life activist, stated that when an abortionist performed on a 12-week-old fetus, quote, we see talking about in an ultrasound image, the child's mouth open in a silent scream. This is the silent scream of a child threatened imminently with extinction. (laughs) However, I think this is an emotional pull with no sound backing. I've never heard this argument before, so it kind of surprised me, but it's kind of like how a lot of folks believe you're hearing a lobster scream when it's being cooked, but it's really just steam exiting the shell. Right. And then there's also things that happen like, like little, like a, like whenever you die, like initially, like there's those jerks, like there's things that happen Uh that aren't necessarily meaning any more than it's just something that happened. Like it's just something uh, reacting to a stimulus. Right. And as someone who has seen an ultrasound with my kids, like maybe th- there's a spot to where you could make out a face at somewhat, but they're not the most clear pictures at all. So it, so th- the whole silent screen thing is just there to tug on the emotions. It, it has no basis in reality. If the ultrasound is indeed catching the fetus with a mouth open, it just is a mouth open. Talking about a silent screen, you're interpreting, you're putting your own emotions into that. Exactly. And now that also doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, though, right? It's just it, it's it's a way to interpret something that you're watching. You're definitely seeing some kind of cause and effect, whether or not it's no different than if you, you know, touch a certain tendon in one part of your wrist that you can move the end of one of your fingers. Like, I don't know if you guys ever played with that when you were a kid, but, you know, things have cause and effect in the body mm-hmm. uh, and it would be different if there weren't scientific findings. So I found real doctor findings. Um, According to a review by Britain's Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, I knew I was going to struggle with that word. Um, Most neuroscientists believe that the cortex is necessary for pain perception, and the cortex does not become functional until at least the 26th week of a fetus's development, long after most abortions are performed. This finding was endorsed by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which stated that there is no legitimate scientific information that supports the statement that a fetus experiences pain. There are actually a number of other studies that seem to back the side that the fetus most likely does not develop the ability to feel pain until well beyond the point of abortion. And mm-hmm. there were more actually referenced right there in the pro and con that will end up sharing. That is something I love about the pro and con list that they do is they they do try to give you a really good reference to go and find the studies that they're talking about. So I would say if your question out there is whether or not the fetus feels pain, I think we have reason to believe that it doesn't. Um, that's honestly not a question I've asked myself. Uh, that was kind of a discovery that that was one of the top 
pro con arguments. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how to. I mean, just with my thoughts on abortion being what they, they've been firmly in place for many, many years. So, like, if there was a situation to where one magical kid of mine magically occurred within the next couple of weeks, you know, I wouldn't have an issue with that because, I, you know, I've already had, you know, I've already decided what I thought about it. But, you know, it's like, you got to follow the science here. You got to follow the logical science. You know, when you have a doctor that is, you know, talking about emotions and trying to elicit emotions from, from you, doctors don't do that. You know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't do that. You know, they're, you know, it, it's just once you do have that emotional heartstring push, you should really question the integrity of the person bringing that to you and question their message as well, you know? And, and like, it's, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they don't. They don't feel pain. I mean, like a seven week well, fetus and, in your belly. But now that it's been proven, though, because we have to keep in mind, like some of these things are just by what's observation, right? Like we used mm -hmm. to not really believe that germs existed. But then whenever we started to be able to like get into microscopes and seeing them on a level, like you can no longer say that that doesn't exist. Right. So I totally do understand being a human that looks for faces and things. That if you saw that action, you could totally relate that as something being in pain. But it does kind of seem that there's a lot of evidence out there that that's not really a thing that's happening. Um, and you know what? We'll always keep in tune. But I guess with everything that's out there and available today, it seems like that's not the case. Indeed. What is the so, next one on the list? Yeah, the next on the list. And this is more something to talk about. I did not really feel right trying to find like facts on this. Um, and it might not even be a long point of conversation. But the idea of is aborting due to a profound abnormality okay or is it discrimination? Um, I did find kind of the dumb con that, that came up with it mm -hmm. of the abortion eliminates the potential societal con, con, the, the potential societal contributions of a future human being apparently we almost had a world without justin bieber y'all oh, um, no. yeah they there's apparently a short list of celebrities uh that they bring up as part of this conversation so for those that never asked Here's some other ones that I guess their parents almost <laughs> thought about giving them the old boot. There's Celine Dion, Cher, and Tim Tebow apparently talks about this, that he was almost, or he, they, they were considering it or that somebody had tried to talk to them about it as an option, I yeah. guess is kind of the point. But I don't know, the, the whole like celebrity end of it uh, isn't that just the counter argument to like if you could have aborted hitler would you have aborted hitler like i, I don't know if that's like an argument i can ever fully get behind is but who would we have not had or who would we have maybe been able to get rid of is the counter to that though right <laughs> yeah like why you know and this is not knocking tim tebow but he was really only famous for being a football player like I think there are plenty of other football players that could have filled his spot if he weren't around. And, and, and like the could have would, it's a could have would have should have deal too. It's, it's, it's hype you know, hypothetical. I mean, if they didn't get famous, would people care? No, I mean, I, I you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's yeah. a ridiculous hypothetical question really. And, and like, when it comes to the discrimination part, mm -hmm. maybe there's meat on the bones there um, because, you know, to take about, think about if somebody uh, was pregnant and they discovered their baby had down syndrome, you know, and they thought, Hey, I don't necessarily have the resources to take care of this baby, you know, I mean, some may say, well, why don't you consider adoption? Well, why should the woman have to choose to go through nine months of a, of a, of carrying a child in her belly that she doesn't plan on keeping, you know, if she wants to, sure, that's on her, but, you know, just force, you know, it's, it's because there are also things too, to where you can do like a DNA test and find out ahead of time too. And then there's the talk to of like, like designer genetics, you know, like if of a future to where you could kind of like weed out like bad genomes. Oh, my, this kid has a potential for down syndrome. Let's just take that little part out and boom, you got a baby, you know, it's, it's, yeah. And, yeah. and we're kind of close to that. There's a lot of ethical discussion on that though, because you'd mentioned kind of the, the idea of the designer baby. Like mm -hmm. if there's a way, that they can kind of get this science kind of worked out in a way that can be great 
and, you know, ensure things like, hey, maybe we can make it so this child doesn't have Down syndrome or things of that nature. Um, and there are some, by the way, there's some abnormalities and stuff that to date, we do not know how to help a child survive once they're out of the fetus. So that does still exist. Um, I don't need to go into them. That's a little bit darker than I think I want to deal with right now. But th- like I-, I will say like as much as sometimes, unfortunately, a fetus will develop with certain body parts missing mm-hmm. or not developing the right side out. So those are things that exist. And I do honestly think that that is why it is so important to still keep abortion legal, because if it is legal, it is easier for people to get that procedure if they are having to deal with something like that. But man, like it does kind of make me pause, though, because the whole idea of, you know, being able to test for things like autism, for example, um, now that used to be way different. I mean, now there's actually treatments. Mm -hmm. There's a more understood like way to raise a child with autism. We're more likely to diagnose it earlier and be able to do certain therapies. And there's even some interesting stuff out there. Um, with like using kind of being able to remap by some kind of electrotherapy, not the same as electroshock. I haven't looked into it too much, but I do know I have seen some stuff kind of float across my attention that, you know, there are ways to possibly cure things. And that I think has to be something that you weigh out personally uh, as far as, is this something that I honestly believe I have the means to take care of. I mean, and this is right. Like this almost goes back into the, like the, the general thing of most people are making decisions about whether or not to have an abortion as to whether or not they can take care of a child in general. This is still part of that same conversation. And I totally understand making the decision that you don't have the means to take care of somebody with certain things going on and needing to make very hard decisions. So I don't see me being able to support saying, well, you're not allowed because there's medical stuff out there, especially when there's such restrictions to that medical stuff. Like it would be different if say we had a little bit more of a socialized medicine system, even if it was only for birth if it was only for intervening children and making sure that they could live like through anything that, you know, would be on the short list of, well, if women would want to get an abortion for this, 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 and this reason, but we have cures for it. Okay. If that world existed, I could kind of see that argument a little bit better, but I, I just don't think that it is strong enough to say that we should make it illegal for everybody. I, I get where it would make somebody maybe take a pause before they made the decision based on that, but I'm just not sure for me, that's just a decent enough reason to say nobody should ever be allowed to make this decision because we don't have a system that would support helping them to get through that hardness. And there's a part of me too, that thinks this argument is kind of another one of those like conservative manipulations too, because at the end of the day, this is just a conscious matter. You know, if, if, if a woman decides to have that abortion because a kid has down syndrome, for instance, that is on her. That does not mean she has, is trying to discriminate against each and every person with down syndrome. She is assessing what she can do as a parent and she has every right to go in. So, you know, this idea of that there are groups of people that, you know, will, will like look at an ultrasound of a baby. And if it doesn't fit their idea of perf- perfection, that they will, um, you know, like get it cleared out and try again. I don't know if that's even necessarily the case, you know, a, a lot of times I'm, I'm sure there are cases that could be pointed out again, no absolutes here, but I, I think more than anything, I, I think this, this is c- an argument not would told in the best of intentions, if that makes sense. Yeah, I also wonder about that because it goes to, generally speaking, people who support making abortion illegal tend to be of a certain political party that also tends to be anti-socialized medicine. So it does... It, it just doesn't jive for me. So I kind of understand that where this might be a, oh, think of the children thing. Like, mm-hmm. and, and by the way, when we say the, oh, think of the children, we are kind of talking about the, maybe you don't really care about the kids. Maybe you're just trying to play on emotions because I don't like emotional manipulation. Personally, I like logic and facts. And that's why like, I might like make a lot of jokes that I'm mostly logic rocks at this point, <laughs> but uh You know, so to me, it was interesting to read into, but I'm just not sure that 
it needs to be a reason to make it not legal. I think that's more of still, you need to make a personal choice based on your resources, your beliefs, and, you know, what you know, what knowledge you have on you, right? Because that's mm-hmm. really all you can do. It's like I've had conversations with my stepdaughter because, you know, they're a Christian and, uh, you know, tough conversations happen as they get older. And I'm going to give it out there to anybody who's a Christian. It's like, hey, you have to kind of talk between you and Big G and know what's okay. Like you need to have that conversation yourself. Like you're not in a religion where you don't believe that you can, and you just need to feel good about your decisions. So, indeed, indeed. What is the next one on the list? All right, the next one I wanted to talk about because it was interesting. I love the ones where there are direct countering information and digging into them, and it is long-term damage to the mother. Uh, particularly in regard to future pregnancies. I did want to look into as far as if it's safe. I learned the risk of dying from giving childbirth is around 14 times higher than from having an abortion. And the mortality rate of a colonoscopy is more than 40 times greater than that of an abortion. Isn't that that a colonoscopy? (laughs) Well, but that's just colonoscopies aren't that the high of a mortality rate. It's just more of that sticker shock. It it goes back into the thing I mentioned earlier of, oh, well, after 40, you double your risk of, well, what are you doubling it from? So it is still 40 times more dangerous to get a colonoscopy than to get an abortion. Um, The Mr. Reverend has had one of those. (laughs) So just to put that into perspective. So we did kind of look into that a little bit back then, but I did think that was super interesting. As far as long-term effects, there were some Chinese studies published that were taken as support that abortion can increase the likelihood of breast cancer. But then the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists basically all turned around and refuted that claim. So when I looked into it, basically that's what I found was, yes, there was, I guess, some some studies out of China um, and Asia, and then there were a lot of counter studies that have kind of said, mm, not so much the case. There was another study published by the peer-reviewed International Journal of Epidemiology that estimated that about 15% of first trimester miscarriages are attributed to a prior history of induced abortion and stated that included, a, that, sorry, it kind of kept talking about the the induced abortion by vacuum aspiration. So just to kind of point it out, they're not talking about like if it's early enough on and you're doing the pill situation, these studies were talking about like it is later and you have to do like the vacuum aspiration or they actually go in. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so they kind of associated it with a risk of first trimester miscarriage in a subsequent pregnancy. I did dig a little into the study and I found it interesting that it referenced a Danish study in its own summary. However, it's mostly focused on, like I said, the vacuum aspiration procedure. And when you consider that this is a trauma to the organs involved, to me, it kind of makes sense that it would increase the likelihood. But another notable note is that the demographics are mostly similar until you get to family income. Those who had an abortion previously were a lot of lower, you know, the statistics were they were more lower income people. And there are other studies that have attributed miscarriage or spontaneous abortion with lower income households, which actually makes me wonder if that's more of the factor than it was of actually having an abortion, right? Because Mm -hmm. you go into, that's what stinks about studies sometimes is they can focus on one thing and it can kind of make it look like it is related to that, but then there might be other studies. But if, in poverty, if people who are in poverty are having higher abortions and or higher miscarriages and are also more likely to have an abortion. So, of course, that would factor in that more of them would have maybe been impoverished or had a previous abortion. We- um, I do have a, a link to the article where I talk where it talks about some of these studies that we'll definitely include. Yeah. And. It's interesting that note that um, th- th- that the poor people, um, you know, yeah, it's once again, if, if healthcare was equitable in this country, uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have have to deal with the, this type of stuff. But also on the flip side, too, yeah, like if you do have a medical procedure that does put you at, you know, some risk for other things down the way. I mean, that's just 
par for the course. I mean, the body is being um, attended to in ways it normally isn't, you know, like the liquid with my surgery. I mean, that does, didn't happen to me every day. And who knows if complications uh, could potentially arise from that. So like going into the doctor, there's always going to be some sort of a risk. So, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it does affect, you know, uh, in some particular cases, it sounds like the, the chance for some women to have a successful birth after the fact. But again, it's medical risks happen. Yes, but you also, yeah, and it just goes back into, well, which one is it? Is it the poverty or is it the prior abortions? Because that would that would be something you'd, you would need to know going into your study how to factor for it. And you'd mm. have to have a separate pool for poverty, no prior import, no prior miscarriage, and then you know, and it would it would be interesting too to find out you know just how much those poor people in that study had like edu- sex education training and access to uh, prophylactics. You know whether that be a condom, birth control, IUD, or anything like that. Because mm-hmm. again, thanks to religion, lots of people think they don't necessarily have to have that, or they've not been raised to really understand it. Right. So the last major pro con thing I wanted to go into that I felt they kind of countered each other well was psychological damage. Mm -hmm. Um, One study claims, quote, young adult women who undergo abortion may be at increased risk for subsequent depression. Mm -hmm. However, I immediately questioned this as it typically takes from one to nine weeks for the HCG levels to return to zero, which that's human growth hormone. It's a hormone that can affect depression. I think you get where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. These hormones are still going to dump from your body, um, even if you've had a a miscarriage or an abortion. Like I just to throw it out there in the world of being clear, I've had a miscarriage once before. I did experience that kind of almost not postpartum levels, but a dump afterwards, even though like when it happened, I didn't fully accept that that's what had happened, if that makes sense. I was in a little bit of denial, Mm -hmm. but unpacking it years later and thinking about like kind of how I felt immediately after, it it kind of did make sense to me. And when you think of it that way, it does make sense. Uh, I did find a pro-con blurb that kind of summed up the counter for this best though. Um, There's a peer-reviewed study comparing the mental health of women who received abortions to women denied abortions. And they found that women who were denied abortions, quote, felt more regret and anger and less relief and happiness than women who had abortions. The same study also found that 95% of women who received abortions, quote, felt it was the right decision, quote, a week after the procedure. Um, There's studies by the American Psychological Association, the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and researchers at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and they all concluded that purported links between abortion and mental health problems are unfounded. So it actually seems like like when all was said and done and the dust was settling on this one, that it caused more damage to deny someone the ability to make the decision than allowing them to do it. So uh, I'm not not. even sure there's much more to say about that. Like it just kind of, yeah, it did kind of make sense because to me, of course, you're going to feel something of of a hormonal shift and, and sure there might even be some doubt and, and regret in a sense, but it goes back into once the hormones fade and it settles out, it does seem like most that do it seem kind of fine with the decision that they made. Because again, when this is, not like blowing your nose. Okay. Like if you make that appointment to go see the doctor, you're doing it for a purposeful reason, you know? So why would anybody that consciously chose to do that be upset by it? And it's not like a drive-through service, by the way, like (laughs) you go, you have a conversation with a doctor, they look in and look at your body. Like, I don't know anybody who has ever walked into a doctor's office and had surgery the same day. Abortion also does not work that way. Um, So just going to throw that one out there. And then I had just two cons that I wanted to bring up out of these lists. Um, I think the dumbest con that I read going through this, reducing the number of adoptable babies is apparently one of the top 15 anti-abortion arguments and (laughs) is pretty much the easiest one to refute. Like we have talked about this on the show. Um, Just Google foster care pandemic United States and you'll see any number of articles talking about how this has actually worsened. 
in like since the pandemic, but it was struggling before then too. And there is a there's a Texas foster care crisis getting work. Yeah. Uh, or getting worse, sorry, article that I'll have Tim include in, in, the, in the show notes. And then also interestingly, because I did look into this one because I thought it was an interesting con, um, there were some cons that mentioned that abortion dis- disproportionately affects African-American babies. Black women are 3.3 times as likely as white women to have an abortion. And in looking into this, I found a pretty brilliant Time article that addressed this more succinctly than I could. Um, The charge that abortion is racist is commonplace in the pro-life movement. If the womb is the most dangerous place for an African-American, that makes Black women the victims of racism, the real racists. Put like that, it doesn't make much sense. The metaphor ignores the subjectivity of Black women. Once again, a woman is a vessel, a place. In this case, a hostile place. Imagery of abortion as slavery or genocide allows abortion opponents to posture as anti-racists without having to learn anything about the lives of Black women or lift a finger to rectify the enormous and ongoing legacy of slavery and segregation. Just shame Black women into giving birth to more children than they feel they can safely bear or care for and all will be well. Um, so yeah, so basically it goes into kind of the same thing I brought up earlier of, is it more likely because of their skin color or is it more likely because they, there's a poverty percentage there too, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. not something that we are blind to, you know, people of color are more likely to fall in the poverty category and that would then again lead to something that kind of is like I don't know. It's just, it's, it, I, like I said, they put it more succinctly than I could. It is basically really washing away having a real conversation of why that demographic is part of that number, it, because it probably has more to do with the poverty and struggles than it has anything to do with the color of their skin. And a lot of this actually came because in Texas of all places, <laughs> they put up these asinine billboards with like pictures of black babies and like saying that they were becoming endangered. Like people complained so bad it did not last. Um, mm. But that was a ridiculous thing that I learned that happened during all of this. So I, I had no idea that was a thing. So I, I'm glad I don't live in Texas anymore, y'all. Um, I'll throw that out yeah. there. So you can you can look that up. Um, on your own if you want to. The Time article that I referenced is called Six Myths About Abortion. And that was where they, that paragraph that I just read was from. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, once again, we have arguments that are being based in emotional hysterics, you know, and um, I, I, again, I, I think it's at the end of the day, it's important for people to kind of take a step back take a breath and examine what people are actually saying here. Um, yeah. And, and just also to, to, when it comes to, you know, black women getting abortions or minority women in this country, getting abortions, take a to think about how society kind of our, our society is built to not help them. It's not, right. you know, it's, it's meant it, this society is built on, you know, subjugating minority people. It's meant for white power and it's, it's, you know, it, it, they lead, you know, it, it's, I probably shouldn't talk anymore because I probably put my foot in my mouth at some place just, um, but yeah, but that's yeah. okay. We can, you can totally, we're, we're done with that one then. And then we are. Yeah. Well, what's interesting though. And I told you, I wanted to bring this up too. something I didn't find on this pro and con list, which is a conversation that actually came up between the Mr. Reverend and I is uh, medical tourism. And the destination country's poor. And that's an article that we will include. But basically, just talking about how this could really just discriminate against our poor. And that goes into, you know, a lot of this conversation has obviously come up because of Texas. Well, Oklahoma followed suit. Now, part of what factored into that, apparently, was that Oklahoma had started to see an increase in their abortions since Texas announced that it was going to start doing its thing. So really what it was, was Oklahoma was experiencing localized medical tourism of being able just to go to Oklahoma instead of Texas, right? Because it's it's the neighbor of Texas. So it's easier. So lower income people who can't hop a flight to California or New York could go to Oklahoma. Now they can't. So now that's going to push the burden onto New Mexico, California, like places that Texans who cannot afford flying drives. 
And that really just kind of fuels my belief that rights are really subject to how much money you have in this situation, right? Because if you don't have the money to fly to California or New York, you are going to drive to Oklahoma or New Mexico or wherever you can go. But there doesn't seem to be anything to discourage medical tourism, right? Like, there, I don't even think the. Uh, I mean, I guess somebody could turn them in in Texas still because of how they kind of have yeah, know, that, done that. that where it's ratting each other out. Yeah, that radical law that they did. I mean, th- there could be that. But then again, like, I, I I don't understand how they can enforce a lot of the stuff that they, they put into that law, you know, because, again, you can't say it's illegal for somebody to go to another state. You can't. Well, and improve it prove yeah. what they did, right? Because you'd have to have proof. But there's an interesting conversation of if this expands and continues to other states that we could see pre-Roe v. Wade when people used to leave the country to be able to do mm-hmm. things like this. And then it goes back to just making it dangerous for people who try to take matters into their own hands, which was part of the reason they decided to make it legal anyway. Yeah. So that's really covering everything I could find. I did think it was interesting that medical tourism didn't come up. But that is one side effect here, too. And that's one thing that, again, minority women probably are going to be the worst victims of in this particular case, not having the cash to be able to go to a place where it is safer for them to have abortions, um, you know, or or something like that. So um, I I can't promise I can I'll put it in the show notes this week if if I'm not able to find it. But I will try and find I I know there are charities out there that do um, like, you know, like you, you send the money to the charity and then they will use that money to help facilitate rides to uh, places. So there, you know, I think that should be something that should be on our list in the show notes going forward. But, um, but you had all of that. And I thought, why not talk about the guy sides of things here? Because, you know, when it comes to like women's health, we need to hear more about what men think, right? (laughs) Yeah. What you can maybe think about, or maybe some of the things you can do yourself. Yeah. So I have my top five rules for men about abortion. Here we go. Number one, you respect women's bodily autonomy. That's not hard. Believe it or not, it's not hard. <laughs> you know, it's like if uh, if if the woman if if the woman agrees to have sexual relations with you and says you have to wear a condom, guess what? You wear a condom because you respect her autonomy. You do not own her. Number. Oh, go ahead. By the way, just going to throw it out there. Anything that is not a yes should just be considered a no. (laughs) Like, hey, can I have sex with you without a condom? Like, if she doesn't say yes, that that's okay, like, you should just be, just wear one. Like, you should just assume that that should be part of your uniform. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. (laughs) Um, Another another rule here, don't put the woman, women in your life in a position where they have to consider abortion. You know, like, if you are having sex with them, we're protection. It's not hard. You know, if if you are of a Christian sort and you have kids and you don't want your kids to consider it, teach them proper sexual health, you know, um, teach them about prophylactics, you know, be, be, be realistic. You know, it's like abstinence is not necessarily a bad thing. It is only a bad thing when it is the only thing that is taught to kids, you know, right. It should be taught as an option. I totally 100% agree. Should it be taught as the 100% guarantee to not get an STD or get pregnant? Oh, yeah, you should totally teach the 100% guarantee, but also maybe give them tools um, for what to do. Because, you know, you should also teach kids like not to injure themselves, but maybe you should also teach them some first aid, too. It's just kind of a way to think about it. Yeah, because we've, I mean, even kids get to the point to where the, you know, you know, curiosity and touching and feeling could turn into something more like that. Adults experience situations like that all the time to where just before they know it, they're off in the bedroom doing stuff, you know? So realizing that reality is important and realizing that your kids are going to potentially face this reality is important too. And also there's something to consider. You can look it up for the scientific terminology. They have actually found that at certain points of arousal, there are decision-making parts of your brain that start shutting down. Mm -hmm. So that is why I personally believe that you should be teaching tools because it at least gives you more options to filter through when you do start having logic shut down where you're not just giving it a one yes, no. 
right? It's mm -hmm. if you're only giving one yes, no, it's like, mm, should I have sex or should I not have sex? Well, the, the, yeah. <laughs> right. Like it's more likely to lean yes. And then end of questioning. But if you give other tools, it's like, but should I wear a condom or should I not wear a condom? You know, you're giving more things for that brain to maybe go through as options rather than one thing to shut down immediately because it wants the candy. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Another thing to consider, if you have sex with a woman with no protection and she gets pregnant, guess what? Congratulations, you're a father. You can ask her if she wants to get an abortion. That is a completely legitimate question to ask. But if she says no, guess what? You're a father. You can ask her if she, if, if you were so inclined, if you wanted to raise the baby alone, if she expressed that she wanted to have an abortion, you can say, hey, why don't you give birth to the baby? And then I will have sole custody. You can ask. But if she says no, she's getting an abortion because go back to rule number one. It's her choice. It is her body. It's technically hers that is being put at risk in the situation, too. I did want to throw a caveat out there for any of the people who might be impregnated. Uh, there's there's a very uh, popular way of responding to a man bringing up abortions. And that is to flip out on the man. I would like to put it out there that maybe we can start viewing this as a very respectful way of acknowledging that they want to support whatever decision you'd like to make instead of making it to be about them not wanting to have a child with you. Um, and it could even be a just not now conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I just wish people gave each other the benefit of the doubt a little bit more. I've seen some pretty horrific conversations go down. <laughs> Or I've seen it, or I've seen conversations like after the fact where like you have the, the mother would give birth and then years down the line when the mother's trying to be friends with her kid, you know, your father wanted me to abort you, right? Oh, Don't gosh. do that. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, it is okay to be religious. I have no problem with religious people, but as long as you are respecting number one, you can still do that. Now, how, how can you say that, Tim, when Christians are blah, 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 you know, like the, the group that talks about subjugating women, you know, like you've grew up in Christian communities. I grew up in Christian communities. The people that actually did follow subjugation were in, in horrible marriages, right? <laughs> I mean, like the best, the best, the, the, the people in, in the Christian community that I thought had the best marriages were not following the subjugation method. They were following the partnership method. You know, like if you have two people living together in a home, they're both adults and one person makes significantly more money than the other person, the person that makes less money, it, it makes sense that they would go out of their way to make sure that, you know, the other, other person, the other person makes the more money. Money. That's that it should be the goal to make sure that their their lives are easy as possible so that they can continue to make that money. It's the same philosophy in my mind as like when you go to somebody's house and there's one more beer left in the fridge. You don't take that last beer, you know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how we got on to taking beer from it's okay to be religious as long as you respect rule number one. So I'm having a giggle there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love when we go on tangents. I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's just like you can be religious there are good religious people you know it, you know there are good christian people that that you know i i yeah. would be glad to call friends that that i think follow what i think the bible really says about what it means to be a christian and and not the evangelical messes you see on tv today you know it's just again at the end of the day men you have to respect women's bodily autonomy you do you just do, you know, if yeah. they get pregnant, it's on you. you. You have, you know, it's like, if you don't want to put a woman into that spot of having an abortion, it's very easy. It really is. Right. And it's like, you know, I've kind of, I've read a bit of the Bible. I, I went to a bit of the Bible classes at my, my Christian university <laughs> And uh, I struggled to find anything that actually supported the idea of either punishing somebody for doing something or making it impossible for them to do those things. But, you know, Jesus very famously said, ye who is without sin cast the first stone where he was trying to address to no longer do those things. So as far as like when Christians make arguments, I have kind of that. Yeah, it is OK to be religious, but there was nothing in 
you know, the, especially with the New Testament and a lot of Jesus's teachings mm -hmm. that seems to support this idea that you're just supposed to take that religion and just really just grind it into people with force. Um, there was nothing about that. It was all about you are supposed to talk about it and spread the word. It's a significant part of your life. And people do talk about things that are a significant part of their life. Have you ever met anybody who just got into essential oils? It is all they talk about. And they're going to convince you that you need essential oils to grace your life. So, <laughs> but yeah, like we, that's, that's a different level of it. You don't need to be that, right? You can just talk about that you are something and be that good example. So I, I yeah, the whole like shoving it down intensity that I get from people, I just never did read anything in the Bible that supported that way of being a Christian. It was really supposed to be more of an, like how I think of omnists of just being kind of, oh, well, that is your religion. This is my religion. And if somebody wants to convert to my religion, then cool. But yeah. I don't think the, the, the whole like going and spreading the word was supposed to be taken as if you don't have X number of conversions a month, you know, big G is going to have some questions for you at the gate. Like it's not, there's no quota. Like it's okay. You can just talk about who you are as a person and let people decide if they'd like to mirror anything that you do. And I, I missed the part of the Bible where it talked about, you know, how you get into politics and, you know, talking about, you know, it, 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 oh God. that's, that's a whole different topic that, you know, we can tackle on a different day if we're brave enough, but, um, but I, I, you know, and, and like I said, for the topic that, that we have here, um, you know, this is simply a one-on-one um, type of thing. There is a lot more information out there in the show notes. We will have uh, some links to some of the articles uh, that, uh, the Reverend found. Um, and we encourage you to do a deep dive. I think the important thing here is that the more knowledge you have, the better choices you're going to make, you know, yeah. it, you know, yeah. It, well, it's funny. It's like, uh, I like that I challenge my views because it makes me more secure in them. Right. Like I went and I read some very interesting things that gave me pause, but overall I don't feel swayed. I don't feel that it changed. And that's okay. I just feel more confident in that now. Because I think a lot of the reason people get so upset and hot and bothered is I, I personally, this is a humble belief of mine. I think we get really self-conscious when we say we believe something, but we don't really know for sure. Have it maybe possibly vetted yeah. that belief, right? Or the thing that we do, right? Think about how self-conscious people get when you talk about like their eating habits, right? Like they, they do, they get self-conscious about it and that's okay. I understand. But mm. sometimes I do think it's because they don't vet and think about some of the decisions. So uh, financial, that's a really good one, right? Like people get really self-conscious when you start talking about what they spend their money on or what they quote, waste their money on. Um, because yeah, some people do like kind of indulge by a lot. So I could see feeling self-conscious and getting defensive, but it is ultimately your business what you buy, by the way. Yeah, and and um, and, and, and yeah, ultimately here the, the the purpose of this was yeah, we like to question our beliefs. It is important to question your beliefs. If you don't question your beliefs, do you really believe them? You know, you you don't at that point. You know, right. And if yeah. you're the type of person that feels that urge to constantly question other people's beliefs, it might be healthier, and you might keep friends longer if you've learned to take that same energy and maybe do it inward, right? Like question yourself and your beliefs and form those opinions really well, but you don't have to necessarily force people to your beliefs to validate your beliefs. And I think that's a lot of where people like do that, that, that almost innocent driver to that is that they want to know that they're right. But I think sometimes it just kind of takes this weird toxic twist and then you end up just kind of losing friends over and over. It's kind of like how I had to learn over time. Like I needed to stop giving advice when I wasn't being asked. Right. Because I realized that that war on my friendships, but that was such a good thing for me to realize. So if you are that person and you feel like you lose a lot of friends over your religious conversations, I just wanted to throw it out there. Take a minute. Think about it. You can research things. You are allowed to change your opinion. You did not come out of your mother's birth canal going, you know what? I think I'm going to be pro-life. You know, you didn't always think things, you develop things, and therefore you can evolve thoughts too. And I think that's really like why we like to have these conversations. Indeed. And at the end of the day, Christian folks, 
be more like Mr. Rogers, less like Jerry Falwell. I think the world would be a much better place if uh, religious folks in general or just people in general follow that mindset, you know? All right. <laughs> like, oh, I, think, I think we're done. I think we just like both nodded at each other. I was like, yes, I think we've covered this this topic and I think we're ready to, to maybe say goodbye for another week. All right. I, I think that's a good idea. And so let's uh, <laughs> wrap it up here again. Thank you all for listening. We have a lot of shows now on the network, whether uh, it's Friends Stalking Nerdy, Hump Day uh, with Tim and the Professor, um, the TNT Review. We now have Ex- uh, Excelsior Journeys with George Saroy and other ones on the horizon. So definitely excited for that so keep on listening and folks every saturday we're going to have something in this podcast space to entertain your ear holes until we meet again we bid you adieu bye bye baby subscribe to friend stalking nerdy on itunes the google play music store as well as spotify remember to support friend stalking nerdy on patreon goodbye darling